This class is really about the Messianic era, known as Mashiach, who we are waiting for to bring about peace and security and unity to the whole world, not just for the Jewish people, but for the entire human race, as well as the world, the animals, the wolf shall lie with the lamb, as Yeshaya says. We are waiting for that to happen and happen immediately. God knows we need it more than ever, right? Okay. Now, thank you, thank you. Amen. So, we... Um, we have something in Judaism that actually differentiates our, our approach and belief in the coming of Mashiach than most other um, religions. Now, I'm not familiar or an expert in other religions, but more, and, and sometimes in Judaism we feel this way too, that the coming of Mashiach is totally up to God, right? It's totally up to Hashem, um, and Hashem has to uh, bring Mashiach, and it's it's a secret of when it's going to happen. It's but it's already preordained, and all the signs are all you know uh, in sync with with Hashem's plan, and everything's just going to happen. We just are hoping that we're living it right now, and not something that's not going to happen in some you know some other generation, right? But the truth is, Judaism is is doesn't take that approach for one very important reason: is that our actions, our behavior our um, good deeds uh, actually play a role and the most important role in bringing about the coming of Mashiach. Now, I know that we know that, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not a new concept. You know, we've heard that before. We know that. But what we're going to learn about tonight is not just from a um, cliche point of view about, you know, do a mitzvah to bring Mashiach, but from an actuality and from a realistic point of view of how our actions um, really determine what the future is going to be. Um, I want to talk about investments for a minute because it's such a good example, and I think most people are, are familiar with the concept. So when you invest, when you invest in, let's say, the stock market, or you invest in real estate, or whatever your investments are, so nobody could predict the future, as as at least that's what we're told, is that nobody knows what's going to happen with the stock market, nobody knows what's going to happen with the markets in general, um, and you could just try to use trends or try to use uh, indicators and try to use past performances as some sort of guide or indicator. And you do your best to, to be smart and diversify and whatever else the financial advisors tell you, right? That's how investments are usually seen and approached. But there's a sense of, for most people, I'm sure there are experts and there are people that don't feel this way, but I'm talking about the general public or you, you could correct me here if, if I'm if I'm off, but most people don't feel like they have control over when and how their investments are going to provide a return on their capital and when their investments are going to mature or when their invest or if their investments are going to mature. They know that they have to make smart decisions and they have to do the best they can research and, and do the, you know, do the work that they could do. But after that, it's totally not up to them. It's totally up to you know, what happens, you know, in the future, which nobody knows, and they basically have to go along for the ride um, if they want to um, enjoy a return on their investments, okay? That's the end of the conversation about investments. Now, as far as our life and as far as our, um, as far as our approach to the future and as our approach to Mashiach, so we have to eliminate the idea that the coming of Mashiach is out of our control. And I've been, I'm guilty of this, and I'm sure many others, and we're all guilty of this, and I'm sure, or at least most of us, is that it's in the hands of Hashem. We pray, we daven, we hope, and we demand Hashem has to bring Mashiach, but we don't necessarily feel a sense of control or a sense that we actually could make it happen. Um, and, and we have to eliminate that idea that it's really out of our control. And the more we convince ourselves, and the more we study, and the more we act, realize that it is within our control, there's a feeling of relief or a feeling of excitement about what the possibility is and what the potential is. It's like it's like when someone introduces you to a new uh, a new business idea or a new um, um, uh, education idea or something that excites you that you could actually do now or take part in it, it. You feel like a whole sense of there's a whole new world that opened up for you. And that's what we're going to do now with the coming of Mashiach. We're going to learn a lot about what's expected, how it's going to happen. 
uh, to some extent, but more, most importantly, what our role is in the in the coming of Mashiach. So before we go into the text of the parsha and why we're and why this is the topic of this week, I want to talk about the Beis Hamikdash, the Holy Temple. And we're going to learn about this in this class. There's a text coming up, but I want to use that text to start the class. I'm just going to verbally talk about it, and we'll see it in the text later. Shlomo HaMelech um, spent years and years and hired the best uh, um, architects, craftsmen, uh, to plan the building of the Beis HaMikdash. It was the most intensive um, spiritual project that was ever undertaken, and it was beautiful. It was perfect. It took, I think it took 20 years. Um, and it was just spectacular. But you know what Shlomo HaMelech also did? And then, the, 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 the cel in fact, the celebration of the opening of the Beis HaMikdash was so great that this, the, ce the, the celebration went on, and they didn't even fast on Yom Kippur that year because they were so busy celebrating the opening of the Beis HaMikdash. Just to tell you the mood and the vibe that building the Beis HaMikdash brought upon the Jewish nation. But you know what Shlomo HaMelech did at the same time as he built the Beis HaMikdash? In the very beginning, even before the Beis HaMikdash was complete, he built tunnels. And he built tunnels to hide the vessels, specifically the Aron HaKodesh, the Holy Ark, uh, because he foresaw with Ruach HaKodesh, with divine uh, inspiration, that the temple is going to be destroyed uh, in 410 years after it's opened, after it's complete. And therefore, he built tunnels that were so strategically smart in a way that no other human being could figure out how to um, how to access them, but with instructions to be passed down to the kings, um, you know, to you know, from from generation to generation, to teach them how to access those tunnels. And eventually, his descendant, King Sitkia, hid the whole holy ark in those tunnels. So the obvious question is, if Shlomo HaMelech knew that the Beis HaMikdash was going to be destroyed, the Holy Temple was going to be destroyed, how was he able to celebrate the, the completion of it and the creation of it if it's like for not? Imagine you're building a house or imagine you're involved in a project or an investment or a business idea or whatever, and it doesn't matter how long, but you're told it's, at some point it's going to disappear, at some point it's going to uh, die or it's going to um, um, disappear or it's going to be useless or it's going to fail or whatever it is that will basically nullify the the creation of it it probably would take a lot of energy you might still do it because temporarily you might be able to you might still want you know the benefits of what it provides but it would take the energy or the excitement for the fact that you know you know that it's not going to be an everlasting or at least you know a a, a built to last type of of creation or building or structure or business or investment or whatever it is so that being the case, why was Shlomo HaMelech celebrating and where was all his energy coming from if he knew, and all the Jewish people knew, I mean, and all the prophets knew. I mean, it was it was not like a secret that this temple was not going to last forever. I mean, Moshe told them about it. It was, it was, it wasn't a given, obviously, but it was understood that this is a possibility. So why was there such excitement? So I'm going to leave that question and we're going to start with the, with the parsha, and we're going to answer this question throughout the class, and that's going to teach us the most important lesson that we're going to learn tonight. So in this week's parasha, it starts off where Moshe is repeating a little bit of the of the building of the Mishkan, the building of the tabernacle in the desert. And it says that Moshe gathered the whole community, the children of Israel, to assemble. And he said to them, these are the things that Hashem commanded us to make, right? Take a look here at the text. We've just read verse number one. Moshe gathers everyone and tells them we are going to build the Mishkan. We are going to um, build. It's time to work. Look at verse number two. He totally goes ADHD. And he says, six days, we should we work. Could, in other words, you could work for six days of the week. But on the seventh day, on Shabbat, is a holy day of day of complete rest to Hashem. And then he goes on to say the consequence of, of violating the Shabbat. Right? What does it have to do with building the Mishkan? He's in the middle of giving them instructions to build the Mishkan. Why is he starting to bring in the mitzvah of Shabbos, uh, which was not just for then. It was a general mitzvah that he was reminding them of. Why, why then? Uh, and then he goes on to say, you shall not kindle any fire in any of your dwelling places on the Shabbos day. What does it have to do with building the Mishkan? Totally off track. 
Uh, and then let's look at verse number five. We're skipping a verse here. Take for yourself, but then he goes on to say that you should uh, bring uh, an offering and you should bring the, the gold, silver, and copper to build the tabernacle. So this, this, these verses are totally, um, um, uh, what's the word here? Um, totally discombobulated and mixed up or, or off track. Um, what are we supposed to make of this? And here, here it's you know summarizes the question pretty pretty well. After speaking about Shabbos, Moshe pivots to the discussion of the tabernacle, a temporary standard for the holy temple, and the efforts invested in the building of the tabernacle in the first two temples were extensive, but everything was destroyed in such a short span of time. So we're connecting both questions. The question that I posed to you first about Shlomo HaMelech, that both temples were built uh, and the Mishkan were built with such uh, elaborate effort and such detail. However, they were all destroyed, and the people that built them knew they were going to be destroyed. And what is Moshe connecting Shabbat into the into the discussion of building the temple? So now we're going to learn about Mashiach. We're going to learn about the Messianic era, and we're going to learn what the prophets say about what's going to happen in the Messianic era. Uh, it's very important to point out over here that in Judaism, we don't take a verse randomly here and there and just throw it around. Everything has is in context, and everything goes with commentaries and with the sages. Um, and it's very important that we don't just uh, draw our own conclusions or, or claim to understand that we know exactly what it's talking about, because we, ha we have the humility to know that there's layers and layers within the Torah that are beyond our, that some are within our comprehension and some are beyond our comprehension. So in terms of Mashiach, th this is one of those topics that there's, a, there's definitely a lot that we do know from the prophets and from, and from the Talmud and from the Medrash and from Kabbalah, where it teaches us a lot about what's, you know, what to expect and what's, and what Mashiach is all about. However, there's still so much we don't know. And that's important to, to keep in mind. So having said that, this is a verse from Yeshaya, from Isaiah where he talks about during the era of Mashiach, what's going to happen? Hashem's glory, God's glory will be revealed and all flesh together shall see that the mouth of Hashem spoke. What does this mean? Um, I'm just going to quote one of the commentaries. Uh, so it says when Hashem created the world, it says that he spoke it into existence, right? The 10 utterances is what created the world. Let there be light, let there be a firmament, let there be fish, let there be a sea, let there be um, animals. So Hashem spoke um, and in other words, his divine energy through his speech is what created and what keeps the world in existence. When Mashiach comes, everyone is going to see that the entire universe, the materialism of the entire universe is all through the word of Hashem. It's all through the energy that Hashem is, is using to keep it alive. In other words, everything is Hashem and everything is God. And we're going to see that clearly. Everyone's going to see that when Mashiach comes. Now, this is from a prayer of Rosh Hashanah. And we're, this is technically a prayer that we're praying for Mashiach. We're praying for the the, uh, the the coming of Mashiach, just in a bit of a different way. What do we say over here? Reign, Malaych, reign over the entire world in your glory. This is Rosh Hashanah when we crown Hashem as king. So we don't just want it to be a hidden thing that we have to talk about, but we want it to be revealed in a way that the whole world sees it. So we say, reign over the entire world in your glory, be exalted over all of earth in your splendor, and reveal yourself in the majesty of your glorious might all over the inhabitants of your terrestrial world. So even though we're not mentioning Mashiach in this prayer, uh, but it's obvious that such a thing can only happen with the coming of Mashiach, where the inhabitants are, are recognizing and appreciating the godliness that is empowering the world. I want to share a cute story that my father would always tell us on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, it's one of my favorite. Um, it's a story of of the in Eastern Europe. There were there was a period of time, probably about 100 and 150 years, where there were constant battles between the Cossacks and the and the Russians and the Pol and the Polish. And it wasn't just the Cossacks, but there were many different factions that were battling each other. Uh, and in the city of Anapoli, uh, that's a city that's in um, in I think it's in 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 modern day Poland, but it might be in, in, in Russia. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but I'm, I'm pr actually pretty sure it's in Poland, but the, so there was a small Jewish community and there was a, a Jewish uh, tavern, uh, a Jewish owner of a tavern that, you know, he worked really hard to earn a living in the tavern. And one day, a bunch of soldiers from one of these warring factions uh, came to this, this man's tavern and they were, you know, doing, since they just came from battle, so they wanted drinks, and they not just wanted drinks, but they wanted to destroy, they wanted to, they wanted to beat, they, they started beating up the owner, they started breaking tables, they started, 
uh, uh, you know, assaulting other customers. And the Jewish owner is, is he finally get, pulls himself away from them. And he runs to the to the base measures. He runs to the study hall and he finds Rav Zusha, the tzaddik, the holy, righteous Rav Zusha of Anapoli. And Rav Zusha, um, uh, who was wrapped in his talis, um, you know, comes over. Is, uh, I don't know why he was in his talis, but that's just how my father tells the story. Uh, he comes over to the, it's a verified story, though. Uh, he comes over to the tavern and he sees the, these these hooligans just causing a, a a wreck, and he starts to say the prayer of Rosh Hashanah, not the one that we have on the screen, but a different prayer. You might recognize it of a chain tain pachtachal kol my sachava kol mashabarasa that we're saying to Hashem, saying to God, please put the fear uh, or the awe or the reverence, however you want to translate it, in all of your creations and in everything that you created. And he said it over and over and over again. He kept on repeating this prayer. And, and sooner or later, the hooligans started to started to shake and started to get scared. And they just they ran as fast as they can. Um, and they finally came to their commander, but they didn't know why they were scared. And they come to their commander, the commander's like, what's wrong? What, like, what, like, what happened? Who's attacking you? Is is you know the army is the army of the enemy coming at us? No, no, no. We were at this tavern, and this this rabbi comes and starts saying these words, and we we pachtecha, pachtecha, We we just got all scared. And the commander like, what's wrong with you? you guys are soldiers. So you so he says, take me to the tavern. He comes to the tavern, and he sees Reb Zusha still standing there, oblivious, and repeating these words of v'chentein pachtecha. So he interrupts Rabbi Zusha and he says, "You know, Rabbi, I, I want to apologize for my soldiers, but please tell, like, tell me, like, what, what happened? Like, so he said they were destroying this man's business. This is his livelihood. It's all he has." Um, so the commander looked at his soldiers and said, "Empty your pockets and pay for the damages and pay for all the liquor that you had and pay for the the anguish, um, and then you know leave him in peace." Um, the story is relevant because we're talking about the prayers of Rosh Hashanah, so I felt I had to. I wanted to share that. But now back to our conversation about um, the coming of Mashiach uh, and the and the atmosphere that Mashiach is going to bring. So it says, um, this is from the from the 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 Mitla Rebbe, the second Chabad Rebbe, where he writes that the prayers that's that we just talked about says that we will see divine presence for even animals will recognize their Creator. For the prayer continues, and every created being will perceive. For there will be a heightened awareness of godliness in the world, and there will, and as there was prior to the sin of the tree of knowledge, that the world will basically go back to a state of perfection where every creation will know its creator. And the Al Rebbe explains it explains it in in, um, in Tanya a little bit more in more detail. Now, the ultimate perfection of the messianic era and the time of the resurrection of the dead, meaning the revelation of God's infinite energy, because the idea of resurrection of the dead can only come through the infinite energy of Hashem, through the essence of Hashem, that's supernatural, uh, is hinged upon, this is the punchline here, is hinged upon our actions. That what is going to reveal the essence of God, what is going to bring down this energy, this infinite energy that has the power to resurrect the dead, is dependent on our actions and divine service throughout the period of exile. That the whole messianic era that the prophets told us about and that we're waiting for and demanding and the, the resurrection of the dead, of, you know, to be able to see all our loved ones who have passed um, and to be able to bring about this perfection and the end of suffering and the end of illness and the end of pain and the end of war and the revelation of Hashem is dependent on our actions in exile. For it is the mitzvah itself that causes creation to create, creates its reward. That's schar mitzvah mitzvah, that the reward for a mitzvah is the mitzvah. And what is the mitzvah? Well, by performing the mitzvah, we are connecting ourselves and drawing down God's energy from above. So every mitzvah that we do, every good deed that we do, every commandment that we do that Hashem told us to do, it's not that a commandment in a sense that Hashem told us to do it, so we must obey and do it. It's the idea of connection, that we become more connected to Hashem, drawing down the energy of the essence of Hashem that came up with the commandments in the first place. So when we do a mitzvah, because Hashem asked us to do it, we are revealing that level of, of godliness, that infinite level of godliness in the world within a physical, tangible sense. And the more mitzvahs we do, the more commandments we do, the more 
uh, the more we're able to draw down God's energy, eventually it's going to have to give way to a complete revelation of God's infinite energy, which will bring about the supernatural combining with the natural that within the material world will be able to perceive the supernatural, bringing about this level of peace that the wolf shall lie with the lamb and the resurrection of the dead. And all of the miracles that we know are going to happen are going to take place because of the mitzvahs that we do. Let's go on. So now that we know every mitzvah that we do now in exile, when it's not so easy, when we have challenges and when we have obstacles and we have an animalistic soul and desires and lusts and all the things that make us not want to do a mitzvah. So we know that it's going to yield a great manifestation of godly energy during the Messianic era. Great. But how does this help us now? In other words, you're telling me that if I do mitzvahs, or I do enough mitzvahs, Mashiach's going to come, but it may not come in my life. He may not come in my lifetime. My mitzvahs might help, but it may not come in my lifetime. So then I won't be able to, to have an instant, you know, I won't be able to see the fruits of my labor. It's like when you plant a tree for your grandchildren, it's very nice. So it means you're a very good grandfather. Uh, but it's sad that you won't be able to see the fruits of the tree bear fruit. You know and you trust that your grandchildren will, will, will love it and appreciate it and appreciate the work you put into it, and that's, that's all good. But it's still not fair that you won't be able to see it. And in a sense, our mitzvahs that we know are helping bring, you know, bring about this messianic era and bring about the revelation of godliness, we want to see it. We want it now. So let's tackle that question in addition to our previous questions. All right, so this is this is another verse where, um, where okay, I'm not going to explain it too much, but basically... There's something about the time of Mashiach that is hinted that we're not going to want those days or we're gonna, or those days are going to be lacking something. Like, look at the last line. I have no desire in them. That the days that are going to come, I don't desire them. What does that mean? Let's look in the Talmud. So, Rabbi Shimon ben Lezer says, performing mitzvahs while you still find opportunities and you have the financial means and you are still under your own control, as Shlomo Amalek writes, and remember your creator in the days of your youth, because the difficult days, this refers to old age. And the years arrive to which you will say, I have no desire in them. This refers to the Messianic era where in which there will be neither merit nor liability. So what's he saying here? This is a very important piece of Talmud. He's saying that when Mashiach comes, our evil inclination is going to be disappear. We're not going to have desires. We're not going to have neg sorry, we're not going to have negative desires. We're not going to have egos. We're not going to have um laziness. We're not going to have depression. We're not going to have um, any evil or just lust or anything that might draw us to doing something we shouldn't do. We're going to only want godliness. We're going to only want the good, the spiritual, the positive, right? So if that's the case, there's no challenge. There's no obstacle. There's no, you don't, you don't get rewarded or, or cheered for breathing air. You don't get rewarded for doing something that, that there's really no other choice. Like this is it. This is all you got. Angels are like that right now. An angel just does what it's told to do by Hashem. An angel doesn't have an evil inclination. So an angel isn't rewarded for their behavior because they have no other options. When Mashiach comes, we're going to be elevated to the level where there won't be an evil inclination, which means all the good that we do when Mashiach comes is going to be great, but it's not going to be in lieu of all the opportunities that I had to send. Yet in the exile, where we are now, where we do have an evil inclination, where we do have those desires, and we still overcome them and do a mitzvah, that is where the mitzvah stands out as a major accomplishment. And this is what it's saying, that when Mashiach comes, but I have no desire in them, is that it's not just that I have no desire in the, mitzvah, in, the neg in the negativity, but I won't appreciate the mitzvahs as much as I appreciated them during the exile. In, in fact, it says that it will look, we'll look back, when, when Mashiach comes, we're going to look back and regret the opportunities that we had and didn't take advantage of, because now, once Mashiach is here, to take advantage of them is no big deal. Everyone's doing it. It's everywhere. It's growing, growing on trees. So let's let's go straight to um to to that point for a second, and I trust we're going to get back and we're going to tie it all together. So Zechariah writes about the time of Mashiach that he's going to remove all impurity from the land, which means the evil inclination and all negativity. Will um will disappear, unlike now during exile. As Nachmani is here, the Ramban writes over here, from the time of creation, every person has possessed the power to do as they pleased. 
to be righteous or to be wicked. That was our free choice. God did not decide that for us. That is part of the free choice that God gave us. This grant of free will applies likewise to the entire Torah period so that people can gain merit upon choosing good and punishment for choosing evil. In other words, the idea of being rewarded for the, the positive and the mitzvahs and the good that we've done is only possible if there was an option to do bad. But in the Messianic era, the choice of their genuine good will be, na will be natural. The heart will not desire the improper, and it will have no craving whatsoever for it. In other words, there will be no possibility for negativity, so we're all going to be perfect. This is reflected in the teaching on the verse, and the years arrive about which you will say I have no desire in them, which our sages explain in the Talmud that we just read, refer to the Messianic era, when there will be neither merit nor liability, for in the Messianic era there will be no evil desire in humanity. Rather, every person will naturally perform the proper deeds. Thus, there will be neither merit nor liability in them, for merit and liability depend upon desire. So as much as we want Mashiach to come, and as excited as we are, and not just as excited, but as desperate as we are for Mashiach to come, the one thing that we're not going to have is the satisfaction and the gratitude, sorry, not the gratitude, but the gratification from the fact that we overcame a desire and overcame an obstacle to do a mitzvah. So why does this matter? Because now that we're still in this period of time, where our mitzvahs are in, in, in spite of all the challenges that we face and all of the, the lack of visuals that we have of accomplishing a mitzvah. So when you do a mitzvah, when you put a penny in a, in a tzedakah box or give a poor person uh, uh, something to eat or you, know, you do a mitzvah like putting on tefillin or a mitzvah like studying Torah or a mitzvah, you are literally bringing godliness into the world in a way that was not done before. When you say Shema in the morning, you say Shema in the evening, these are biblical mitzvahs, you are accomplishing something. You're you're revealing godliness in a way that is just astronomical, but you can't see it, and that's painful. But at the same time, because you can't see it and you're doing it anyways, is an accomplishment that the angels are are so jealous of us that we have the opportunity to do that. So Rabbi Shul Ben Levi goes on and he says, "This is similar. It's a different Talmud, but it's a similar message." What is the meaning of the verse, and you shall keep the commandments and the, and the statues and the judgments that I command you to do them today? It means that today is the time to do them. Today in this world, in other words, in this physical world where there's exile. And tomorrow is not the time to do them as there is no obligation or opportunity to fill mitzvahs in the world to come. So over here he's talking about um, life versus the afterlife, which is in the world to come. But he goes on to say, furthermore, it means today is the time to do them, but only tomorrow in the ultimate future when Mashiach comes, it is time to receive the reward for doing them. So when Mashiach comes, we will see the impact of every mitzvah. You will, you will literally be able to have a visual, um, a screening of all the mitzvahs that we did during exile and see the impact that we had and the accomplishments that we had in order to bring about Mashiach. In other words, we're going to see the pieces of the puzzle that we played, the puzzle pieces that we put in, the, the impact that we had, the, the rungs of the ladder that were climbed, the revelation of Hashem in the world, how we participated in that and made it possible to bring about the era that we're in now and with the coming of Mashiach. So it's this is all here to inspire us and remind us that now is the time to take advantage of this opportunity that will not exist when Mashiach comes. It will not exist at the end of days. It will not exist after we pass away either. This is an opportunity unique to the lifetime and we need to take advantage of it. Okay, did I skip one here? No, we didn't. Okay. And the Friedrich Rebbe gives us the, uh, the, um, the uh, articulates what it's going to feel like when Mashiach comes in relations to the mitzvahs that we didn't do in exile. When Mashiach comes, may it speedily be in our time. So regardless of how we might feel about it, we want it to happen right now. Uh, then we shall no longer, we shall really long for the days of exile. Why? And by the way, the previous rabbi was someone who was tortured and sentenced to death in communist Soviet prisons uh, and was was like he became so sick from his uh, imprisonment um, and he was sent to, he had to go to Warsaw. He went, was in Warsaw for his daughter's wedding, but then he had to uh, travel all the way till he came to New York. He suffered. He suffered greatly. And not only that, he was a witness of the worst suffering that the Jewish people faced probably ever. And yet, what is he saying here? is that we, we're going to long for the days of exile. Why? Because when Mashiach comes, then we will truly feel the distress that having neglected working at our spiritual service 
then we will indeed feel the deep pain ca caused by our lack of spiritual service. And these days of exile are the days of spiritual service. In other words, now we have the opportunity to prevent regret, regret when Mashiach comes, to prepare ourselves for the coming of Mashiach, may it speedily be in our time. So just like it says, you know, just like, um, you know, motivators and life coaches will always like to say, um, you know, the difference between between wasting time or, you know, being productive is, do you want to be uh, happy now or later? Like, if you just want to waste time and, and be lazy and whatever, so you'll be happy now, you'll do whatever you want. But if you put your, but if you go to work or you do, you know, you, you put effort into what you want to do and, and being productive, you'll be happy later. So it's really being a choice of being happy now or being happy later. In a way, similarly, when Mashiach, we want, want Mashiach to come now no matter what. That's a given. However, if Mashiach is not here yet, we want to take the opportunity to do these mitzvahs because when Mashiach comes, we're going to long for the days that, of the mitzvahs that we missed and the opportunities that we missed. So now, what does this have to do with bringing about these days of Mashiach? So regardless of how we're going to feel, regardless of, of the regret or not the regret, the bottom line here is, and this is something that is accepted and understood by Torah, by all Torah sages, is that it literally is our mitzvah, our mitzvahs that make the difference of Mashiach coming or not. Um, every generation, it says that every generation um, has someone in the generation that is worthy of being Mashiach if the generation is worthy. In other words, it's not the it's not the person that is appointed to be the Mashiach; it's the generation has to be worthy. And that means that we have to be able to, to do the things that are needed from us, each on our own level, in order to bring about this era of Mashiach. As the Rambam says, we're supposed to look at the world as if there's an even scale of positive and negative, of mitzvahs and, and, and the opposite of mitzvahs. And our one extra mitzvah will tip the scale, tip the balance, and bring about Mashiach. And that is the Jewish view, is that our actions now have a, make a difference. They have an impact. They literally could decide if Mashiach is going to come now or later. Um, and that is something that the Rebbe tried to drill into us um, in, in making us realize that it's not just let's wait for God to wake up and, and bring Mashiach. It's we have to do something about it. And here's the Rebbe quoting his father-in-law on the text that we just read. My revered father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, said that when Mashiach comes... We will grab our heads and shout, Givalt! What could we have we, we could have accomplished so much more in exile, and we missed our chance. Therefore, even though now we don't perceive the full value of our actions, in other words, we can't see the revelation of godliness through every mitzvah, the very knowledge that a time will come when we will regret our inaction should spur us to act. We must add to our Torah, a study of Torah and observance of mitzvahs in a matter of exponentially greater than we were doing until now. We must not suffice by adding only a little bit, or even proportionally, uh, uh, or even a, a proportionally great number. For the time will come when it will be too late to even add one iota of a mitzvah of doing something good. Rather, we must increase in the infinite matter, meaning a matter of self-sacrifice that stems from the very essence of our souls, because that is how we bring about the essence of God. Is that when we when we fulfill the mitzvahs from the essence of our soul? And we, we commit to it from the essence of our soul. We connect on, uh, immediately to the essence of Hashem, which is the level of godliness that we want revealed, which brings about the Messianic era. Here is that portion, that, that text that we opened the class with about Shlomo HaMelech. That when Shlomo built the temple, when Melech, Shlomo HaMelech, the king Solomon, built the temple, he was assured, he was aware that it would ultimately be destroyed. And this is what the Rambam writes. Therefore, he constructed a chamber in which the ark could be uh, entombed with the temple building in deep maze-like vaults. King Yeshia commanded that the ark be entombed in the chamber built by Shlomo, as the verse states, and he said to the Levites who would teach wisdom to all of Israel, place the holy ark in the chamber built by Shlomo, the sons of David, king of Israel. You will no longer carry it on your shoulders, now serve Hashem. In other words, it came the time when they realized that the, 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 it's the time now to hide the ark, to hide the ark. Until today, we don't know where it is. Or at least we don't know how to find it. We know it's buried there somewhere, but we don't know how to find it. And we don't want to find it until it's until it's time because the Aron is very dangerous. Uh, touching it or, or, or mishandling it could be very dangerous. So the question, obviously, is why would Shlomo HaMelech build a temple and celebrate and do all the things that he did, which is the question over here, if he knew that it's not going to last forever, if he knew that it's going to be destroyed. In fact, he built a tunnel to prepare for its destruction. 
which is which is kind of counterintuitive. And it's it's so the answer, and this is what's most important, is that it's not about the fact that it's going to be destroyed and therefore it's all for naught. But those 410 years that it stood played a crucial role in bringing about the third temple, which is going to be built by Hashem, and reveal that whole area as the source of godliness for the entire world. In order to get to that point, we needed the temple for the 410 years that he built it for. And then we needed the second temple for 420 years that it was built for. Before that, we needed the tabernacle, we needed the mishkan uh, to exist in the desert and then in Shiloh in order to prepare and to, and to bring godliness in the world as a way, as a journey to the ultimate redemption. So even though it seemed like a useless investment or a failed investment, it wasn't because it was one step closer, it was one step further of bringing godliness into the world in a way that Mashiach could come and, 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 and the revelation could be here permanently. And here's an example from, um, from the Medrash about how the Medrash, I mean, the Rebbe, uses, the Rebbe quotes this Medrash, that's how I know it, uh, is that the Rebbe quotes this Medrash and asks, how is it possible for Hashem to destroy the, to the Holy Temple? You're not allowed to destroy a shul. It's a mitzvah. It's, it's, it's a negative commandment. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to destroy a holy place. So how could Hashem go against the Torah, his own Torah, destroying the Temple? So the Medrash answers, Rav says, in Arye, a lion came in the month of, Ar of Arye, which is the month of Av, which is compared to a lion, and destroyed Ariel, which is also a lion. And this is all metaphoric here. So what does it mean? The Arye, the lion is the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, whom the verse, or Yeremia, refers to as a lion. A lion has come up from the thicket. He came in the month of Arye, which is the month of Av, which has the astrological sign of a lion. Um, as the verse Yermia sta in Yermia states, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month, the fifth month is the month of Av, because remember, the months go from Nisan. And he destroyed Jerusalem, which is called Ariel, which is the Ariel is the, Ariel also means a lion in a sense, but it means like the city of lions. Uh, and that's the city of, da of David HaMelech. And that's the city that was destroyed by the lion in the month of lion. Why did this happen? Why was the Beis Hamikdash destroyed? Why was Jerusalem destroyed? This happened so that an Arye, that another lion could come in the month of Arye, and also in the in the in month of Av, and this Arye, this lion is going to be God Himself. Uh, and now we're just proving in the next line here about how there's a verse that compares God to a lion, and He will rebuild Jerusalem in the month of Arye, whereas it states, "I will turn their mourning into joy." And he will rebuild Ariel, he will build the base of Migdash, because it says Hashem is the builder of Jerusalem, he will gather the outcasts of Israel. So the, the Rebbe answers the question of how is Hashem allowed to destroy the holy temple if you're not allowed to destroy a holy place, is all, you're only allowed to destroy a holy place as if you are building an even better holy place on top of it. So for example, if you have a synagogue, let's say you have a small shtibel, a small synagogue, like we had here in Chabad, and you need to build a bigger synagogue. So as long as you're destroying the small synagogue, demolishing the small synagogue in order to build a bigger one, you're allowed to do that, or a better one. So Hashem was destroying the Holy Temple in Jerusalem and Jerusalem in a way that he could build a much bigger and better one. Which tells us that the idea of Shlomo HaMelech building the Beis HaMikdash was not for naught that it was going to be destroyed. Neither was the second Beis HaMikdash, and neither was anything else that was done, because it's all a step closer to bringing godliness into the world, revealing godliness in the world, which is the coming of Shiach. And that goes for every mitzvah that we do, the temple that we build within us. If we feel like we did a mitzvah, but then the next day we, 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 we fail, God forbid to think that yesterday was for naught. It wasn't. It was an amazing mitzvah because we brought godliness, we brought us closer, we brought the revelation of godliness in, in the world in a, in a stronger and better way that brings us closer to Mashiach. Okay, so today we failed. Tomorrow we'll try again. The point is, is that every mitzvah and every day and every moment should be given its own character, should be given its own value, because everything that we do has that opportunity to unite godliness with the materialism of the world and reveal godliness in the world, which leads us to the coming of Mashiach. There's one more text here, and we're going to answer the first question about why Moshe Hamela, well, sorry, why Moshe Rabbeinu, um, um, why Moshe Rabbeinu mentions Shabbos in the uh, in the in the description of building of building the Mishkan the Tabernacle. So what does Rashi say? The answer was in Rashi all along, but we decided to take the long route. So Rashi says that why was Moshe telling them about Shabbos as in as a prelude to giving them the laws of the Mishkan? 
is to tell them that the Mishkan does not supersede the observance of Shabbos. That even though the Mishka, building of the Mishkan is for God, it's a mitzvah, but we should not, those should only be, it should only happen during the six days of the week and not on Shabbos. Now, by the way, there are instances where you actually are allowed to observe work in the base of Mikdash on Shabbos, but there's a deeper message here. And that is, is that we're not just talking about the Shabbos of the day of the week. But as we know, that the millenni- the, the, the creation of the world and the and the millenni- and the the millennium of the world is like the days of the week. The first thousand years is like the first day. The second thousand years is like the second day. Right now we are in five thousand seven hundred and eighty four. So we're right now in the sixth millennium. We are in the Friday of creation. And what does Hashem promise us? That the seventh millennium, just like the seventh day of Shabbos, is the day of rest. The seventh day of Shabbos is a day of God, day for God, the day that God reveals Himself in the world. The seventh millennium will be the ultimate revelation of the coming of Mashiach. So Amosha is telling them that by building this Mishkan is not going to um, supersede the observance of Shabbos. It's not going to prevent, or it's not going to. Um, take away the holiness that's going to be revealed with the coming of Mashiach. In fact, if anything, it will increase the holiness and it will get us, it will get us closer there. So every mitzvah that we do, building the Mishkan, remember, is that God wants to rest within each of us. That's the tabernacle. It's not that we have a building somewhere else, but it, within us, we make ourselves a, a home for God. We make ourselves a place where God feels comfortable. We make our homes a place where God feels comfortable. We make our offices a place where God feels comfortable. And by doing that, we are revealing godliness in the world, and we're bringing us closer to the coming of Mashiach. All right, let's recap. And this is just the, the, the what we say on Shabbos in the benching. That we're saying, that may Hashem bring us to the day that is all Shabbos, not just the Shabbos that we're in right now, like it will be tomorrow night, but it should be the, the time of Mashiach, which is considered to be all Shabbos, the whole world is elevated and Hashem is revealed, and that is the coming of Mashiach, and that's the, the seventh millennium. Uh, so just like for Shabbos, we prepare for Shabbos, tomorrow's Friday, so many of us will you know, prepare food and prepare, if we have, we have, we have guests, so we prepare the house for Shabbos. So too, now is in the Friday of creation. In other words, we're in the sixth millennium and we are getting ready for the seventh millennium in order to bring about the coming of Mashiach, in order to reveal the um, the essence of Hashem, which is going to bring about the ultimate peace in the world and the ultimate revelation of, of godliness that will unite everyone and bring everyone together and have everyone only pursuing the knowledge of Hashem and there'll be no more evil, no more death and no more pain and no more suffering. Now, what does it say about Shabbos? That whoever works before Shabbos will enjoy Shabbos. That if you work and you clean your house and you pr- prepare food, you will enjoy Shabbos. So too, in exile, if we work, if we do mitzvahs, if we if we do the things that we're supposed to do while we're in exile, we'll actually be able to appreciate them and, and live them and, and feel them and see the results that they had on Shabbos in the seventh millennium when Mashiach comes. So... To recap, why are mitzvahs significant in the present moment? Because in the time of exile, mitzvahs is an opportunity that we're not going to get again, and they are going to bring about the coming of Mashiach. So I want to read the key points because there was a lot that we that we covered. I want to make sure we get them all here. We have already built a tabernacle, the Mishkan in the in the desert that was in Shiloh as well, uh, and then we built two temples: the Temple of Shlomo that was for four hundred and ten years, and the Temple that was built by Ezra and Nehemiah that was for four hundred and twenty years, with a little bit of a break in, in between with King Hero and whatever. Uh, and they were both destroyed. However, they were all leading up to the manifestation of godliness that comes with it, with the Messianic era. It was because of that effort, because of their efforts and, and their mitzvahs and what they did and what they accomplished, it brings about the Messianic era closer. The godly revelation of the future times hinges upon the work that we put in there during the exile. We have the power to bring Mashiach and we have to see ourselves as the ones that are given this responsibility to do the mitzvahs and to engage in what God wants us to do, because that's how we reveal godliness in the world. When Mashiach comes, we will not struggle to do the right things. The right choices will come to us naturally, and therefore now is when we have those obstacles, and now is when it's a big deal to do a mitzvah. And it's only now, during exile, that we can still change things. That's why we should invest now. Shlomo built the temple from the onset as an investment for the future, even though it was going to be destroyed, but because it was going to lead to the permanent temple, 
he still built it happily and joyously because he knew the he knew the the impact it's going to have and the effort it's going to and, and the the results of, of the ultimate revelation of Mashiach and how it's going to bring about the third temple. So ultimately, let's hope it happens immediately. Um, we've done so. We've done enough. We've lived through enough. Uh, until it happens, we have to do as many mitzvahs as we can. We have to take advantage. But at the same time, we don't want to wait any longer. We want Mashiach to come, and let's hope it happens speedily in our times. Good Shabbos, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, and you're welcome to unmute yourself if you have any questions.